Hey, welcome to another edition of Around the Coin. I'm your host, Faisal Khan. Today with me, I have Luke Salenas. Luke is the Senior Vice President Strategy for Adyen. Adyen is one of those large payment processors that many people don't know about. Hopefully, in this interview, we'll get to learn more about Adyen and where it, how it got started and where it's going. So, Luke, thank you very much for coming to the podcast. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having, giving me the opportunity to have this conversation. So before we jump into what Adyen is all about, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what your background is, how did you get started, and more importantly, how did you end up in Adyen? Uh, sure, sure. So uh, my path to payments has been a, a bit be- bit meandery uh, and taken me to to kind of some interesting places. Um, but it, it, prior to Adyen, I was managing payments and fraud over at Uber uh, during a period of substantial expansion. And so my uh, specialty is really in global payments uh, and risk management. And um, at Uber, I had the the opportunity to work with Adyen as a client. Uh, Uber is a, a major client of ours still today. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I came to Adyen. Um, I've been at Adyen in a few different capacities, uh, originally focused on the supply side of our business, so our relationships with the major card networks and banks, um, and then more recently uh, running uh, our strategy um, for North America, which is really focused on some of our key strategic initiatives um, and, and just thinking about you know where Adyen goes in the next three to five years. So it's, this is a company that not many people sort of know about. So tell us a little bit about what Adyen is and what do they do, and then we'll take it, have, ask more questions from there on. Sure, sure. Um, well, you're absolutely right. It's, it's interesting. We're definitely one of those companies that unless you are in payments, um, you're unlikely to know. Uh, we're really behind the scenes. Um, and what we are is we're a, a global payment service provider. We've been around since 2006. Um, and our story is kind of an interesting one. Our, our founders originally founded a company called Bibit back in the early, early 2000s. And Bibit was one of the first um, really cross-country uh, and cross-payment method gateways that was available to uh, particularly European companies at the time who wanted to you know, have a single point of entry, or at least technical entry, into a number of markets and a number of payment methods across Europe and across the globe. Um, Bibit was a tremendous success. It was sold to the Royal Bank of Scotland and uh, ultimately became uh, an important part of the, the world pay service offering. Um, and then the, the same founders basically said, you know what, there's a whole bunch of new technology uh, and new regulatory movement, particularly within Europe at the time in 2006. And they said, let's, let's do it again. So the name Adyen actually means all over again in Surinamese. And, um, Ooh, very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, and so what they set out to do was to take a lot of this new technology um, that, was, that was coming out in the mid-thousands, particularly internet technologies, and apply that technology and also their own knowledge and experience in the payments industry toward creating a company that could really be a single solution for large merchants with sophisticated global needs um, so that those merchants could you know, consolidate from the you know, sometimes upward of 50 or 60 providers that they were using across payments and risk um, and, and uh, acquiring, et cetera, et cetera, and consolidate to a single, a single point of entry into that complex ecosystem. And so since 2006, that's, that's really been our focus, is working with those large international merchants um, to simplify and streamline their approach to payments and also to be a, a really consultative partner, helping them craft a payment strategy that you know can be effective across multiple geographies, multiple payment methods, uh, and multiple channels. And you're not exactly a U.S. company. You're a Dutch company. I mean, you're based out of Amsterdam. That's where you guys grew up from, correct? Uh, correct, originally. At this point, we're co-headquartered Amsterdam, San Francisco, 
um, and a very substantial amount of our business comes out of the the U.S. Um, but we are originally we were founded in Amsterdam. Amsterdam remains our largest office, um, kind of the spiritual <laughs> headquarters, so to speak, of the company. Mm. And a lot of our culture is reflective of that background. So a lot of cheese in your dinner and lunches, huh? <laughs> a lot of cheese. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, where else is Adyen based? Because uh, I know that you guys have offices all over the world. We do. At this point, we've got 13 offices, um, the largest being Amsterdam and San Francisco. But we also have a large um, um, APAC headquarters in Singapore, uh, a large LATAM headquarters in Sao Paulo, and smaller offices throughout Europe, Sydney, Mexico City, etc., New York. And uh, how many employees worldwide total? So at this point, we're over, over 400 worldwide employees. Um, and that's, like I said, spread across a number of offices, but, but uh, the largest being Amsterdam and San Francisco. So in a nutshell, I mean, you know, people look at Addy and they think, oh, another merchant processor, but you're a whole lot different than that. You are, you prefer actually to be behind the scenes. That's something that you've I've read a lot of your articles by your CEO and he says, you know, yep, we really don't want to come into the limelight or the spotlight. We prefer right. to be in the background. And your speciality is that you can integrate and are integrating and have already integrated with various payment systems across the world. So are you an aggregator, so to speak? Not necessarily. Um, so we are, in fact, ourselves a member of Visa and MasterCard. So, you know, if you're familiar with the the ecosystem, the typical kind of value chain in payments, particularly card payments, it's often a complicated yeah, yeah. one, right, with multiple players, a gateway, a processor, an acquirer. Um, but it's important to so know you're a that, payment facilitator, a PF. So, so we are actually an acquirer um, oh. ourselves. And this is the piece that I think uh, trips people up because a lot of providers um, who've, who've taken a similar position to us in the space from a technical perspective, you can think like a Stripe or a Braintree, um, a lot of them have come to, to the space more from the perspective of, of, of a real focus on technology and then just working with banking partners, often in a role like that of a payment facilitator. Um, whereas we have, be, because we work largely with large enterprises, uh, it's really been important for us to own as much of the stack as possible. And so for that reason, uh, we're ourselves a member of Visa and MasterCard in Europe, um, where we're a, a full stack acquirer. Uh, and then we, we work with banking partners in other regions um, but in such a way that we are connected directly into the card networks in Europe, the United States, Brazil, Hong Kong, and Australia today, and, and more geographies to come. Uh, and we really think we're the first provider to have multiple direct uh, acquiring relationships in, um, you know, in all these various markets on a single platform. I mean, that's the first time I'm actually hearing that because uh, the common notion of the popular opinion is that, you know, only banks can be acquirers. They cannot be a, a, another company that could be an acquirer. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and historically, that was the case. Uh, in Europe, the, the original payment services directive uh, expanded access to basically essentially Visa and MasterCard membership, also some of the minor networks, um, to, to non-banks to what are called payment institutes. Um, mm. And then outside of Europe, uh, there's a model that's, that's kind of grown to, to um, allow this in other markets. It's called bin sponsorship. It's a, it's a sort of a complicated topic, um, but fundamentally it allows you as a non-bank to, as, uh, as the name kind of suggests, to rent a bin um, or, or basically you know, rent the license that that bank holds to acquire with Visa and MasterCard. So you'll sometimes hear um, the term acquire a processor uh, to refer to a, a, a company that's been sponsored by a bank. But it, it allows us as a non-bank to connect directly into Visa and MasterCard, even in jurisdictions where we can't get a full membership as a non-bank. 
And the reason, uh, you know, folks would like to know why you need to go into a particular market and forge this relationship is because then you can only legally pick up merchants from those countries, correct? That's correct. Yeah, there are, there's a legacy of, of pretty firm jurisdictional regulation with, uh, with the card networks where you really you need to be licensed in that market in order to service merchants domiciled in that market. And of course, because we're working with a lot of these large you know, multinational enterprise merchants, they often have um, entities that they may want to leverage in multiple geographies. And so you know, our goal is to be able to service you know, as many of those entities of theirs as, we, as makes sense for both us and them, um, which typically is at a minimum a U.S. entity and a European entity, and you know, may include entities in some of these other markets um, that, we've, that I've kind of referenced. Sure. Okay. Uh, competition. Who's your competition? Are you a monopoly in this thing, an oligopoly? Are you the only one? Well, it, it kind of depends on which perspective you're taking on the, the space. Um, there are defi- there's definitely competition from a number of angles, um, but I think we, we inhabit a fairly lonely part of the space. And the way I like to think about the competitive landscape is along a couple of axes. Um, one being a technical capabilities axis, you know, where a lot of our older and larger competitors are kind of at the other end of, of that axis. A lot of them are either bank owned or spun out from banks. Um, they're often operating on, you know, older tech stacks, sometimes even these big mainframe um, technical infrastructures that can only be updated on a fairly irregular basis and are, you know, really uh, tolerant, uh, fault intolerant. Vendor dependent. Right. Um, and so, you know, those those players tend to be kind of on one end of the spectrum. Down at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, you have the newer, more more tech forward uh, players in the space like ourselves, you know, a Braintree, a Stripe, a Square, you might think to, to some extent. Um, and so I, you have that axis. I think the other axis I, it's instructive to think about is target market. And this is where we differentiate ourselves quite a bit from our peers, our technical peers, um, mm-hmm. which is that most of the, the other companies that are, you know, on the, the forward end of the technical axis are have traditionally really focused on the long tail of smaller merchants, startups, you know, mom and pop um, retail outlets. And that's, you know, definitely a, a very viable strategy and has proven very successful for them. But for various reasons, our focus has been on the very, very high end of the market, that enterprise plus space of really large international merchants. And so in that sense, uh, you know, when you combine those two axes, we're really pretty alone in that, that part of the space where we have a focus on enterprise plus merchants, uh, but also represent the, the bleeding edge of you know, technical innovation and, and change on that front. So you're not doing mom and pop, but you would rather do an airline, for example, correct? Right, right. Um, exactly. Our, our historical strength um, and just the service model that we've created is really tailored more toward those larger enterprises. And naturally, you know, as, as we grow, you know, we're moving down market as some of our um, some of our peers, technical peers, grow, they move up market, and I think it will be really interesting in the next five to ten years to see who comes to dominate that mid market space. And what are some of the problems that you're tackling? Certainly, I mean, okay, granted, you're looking at large transaction volume, large enterprise customers, but what is it that you are doing so differently or are tackling right now? And I found a solution for that others have not been able to do so. It's uh, there. There are a few challenges, I would say. Um, okay. You know, one of them is around global coverage, geographic coverage, and this is where we've had a pretty substantial leg up from the beginning because our roots, you know, were in the the company that our founders originally founded, Bibit, and so we had a lot of experience in connecting to a variety of uh, acquiring partners, a variety of different payment methods. You know, as I'm sure you're aware. 
you know, here in the U.S., we're a very card-centric market, but in a lot of markets elsewhere, uh, cards, credit or debit cards, represent a relatively small percentage of e-commerce volume. There are often other dominant payment methods, whether they be bank transfers or direct debits or uh, local wallet schemes like an Alipay in China. And so our focus um, has always been on providing as broad a coverage as possible. Um, that's definitely one of the challenges that we we help our merchants address. Another uh, is this the series of technical challenges that come with scale. And this is where we really differentiate ourselves from some of our more traditional um, competitors who, who have a lot of market share uh, in that because we're on such a, uh, a newer tech stack, it is much easier for us to deal with the challenges of scale and volume. Um, and, you know, deal with, say, a, a merchant like Uber on New Year's Eve, right, or uh, a number of Chinese merchants on uh, their equivalent of Valentine's Day, their largest shopping day of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that's another set of challenges. I think a third set of challenges that we really help our merchants around is the set of um, less tangible challenges that come with with you know, evolving re regulation, evolving um, network, uh, by that I mean card network, um, compliance frameworks. You know, there's a lot of complexity to the payments industry, and a lot of that complexity requires experience, it requires um, connections, it requires, you know, relationships with the card networks that allow you to, to really navigate those complexities and that's where we can be uh, more so than just a technical provider. We, we really can be a consultant to our merchants and help them, um, help them navigate the, those complexities with a minimum of, of uh, friction. I asked this question of many people, and I ask, you know, what are some of the problem areas in payments? And one thing that props up immediately is that in, in, in not in so many certain words, but it always does prop up, is they say that the payments world globally is extremely fragmented. Mm -hmm. Trying to operate under a single label is inherently very difficult. It seems like you are tackling that problem, the problem of fragmentation under a single account worldwide. Would that be an accurate statement? Absolutely. We really do aspire to be that single solution provider for our merchants where they can plug into us and get access to, you know, as many payment methods as possible, uh, as many acquiring geographies as possible, and just open up their product offering to as many people across the world as possible with, through that single connection. Um, now, that said, of course, you know, it's, it's often uh, more complicated than it sounds. There's often a lot of legal and regulatory and accounting uh, complexities that those merchants have to navigate. But, you know, we're here to help them uh, think through that, navigate through that. Um, and, and we really feel like we've created a solution that allows businesses to expand and grow, you know, more rapidly than ever before. So as of today, how many payment systems are you connected to? Or how many payment types are you connected to? So we're connected to over 250 methods of payment. Uh, wow. Now, now that, you know, saying that, you know, as, as somebody in strategy, I can tell you for most merchants, it's really probably 20 to 30 that are truly relevant. Um, but That's true. Um, but a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, it's that 31st payment method or, or what have you that really gives you that competitive edge, particularly if it's in a, uh, a more exotic market, a more challenging market. So, yeah, we've invested a lot in, in growth across that long list of payment methods. Um, and then, of course, in depth uh, for those payment methods that we think are most relevant to global merchants. So it's, I mean, you know, the old age saying, build it and they will come. That's the difference between your com competition that may not have access to that market and you do and, you know, could very well win the account for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how many payment systems in the world overall? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, certainly north of the 250 that we support, um, there are a number that we don't. And, and that number changes every day. I mean, uh, it's a very so, I mean, uh, If I were to ask you, do you support Bolito in, Mex in, in Brazil? You probably would say yes, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about M-Pesa in Kenya? 
So that's a, an interesting um, an interesting example of one that we don't support today. And so I see. Oh, I mean, uh, I, I guess my question is: Why is it that most of these merchant acquirers or processors are not supporting mobile payments as a viable payment method? It depends. Uh, I think a lot of uh, providers like us, and this is particularly true for us, are extremely merchant driven in what they're supporting. They're going to support you know, payment methods where they see a lot of demand among their merchants, payment methods that some of their you know, larger, more strategic merchants have highlighted as, as, as strategic for their business. And interestingly, that often doesn't include some of the more, what we might think of as the more interesting payment methods, like some of the you know, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, M-Pesa is a good example, cellular billing in some countries. Um, and I think it's important to note that oftentimes those payment methods are really only appropriate for certain verticals. You know, so for instance, um, a cellular carrier build, billing is often only appropriate for gaming or digital goods markets because the costs of, of billing through the, that method are so high to merchants, right? 20, 30 percent. Um, so unless unless your product is like all margin, you really don't have room to be even accepting carrier billing in, in many markets. Um, I think M, M Pesa is a similar one where there is um, there is a, a product limitation with M Pesa. It's a push payment method. It's not a, yeah. a pull payment method, um, and it's a difficult one to reconcile against, which uh, prevents a lot of merchants from from looking at it very seriously until they've got a true a deep presence in the Kenyan market, and often at that point, it's, it's worthwhile for them to invest in a, a more local uh, solution. But uh, the mobile payments field, or the land of opportunity for mobile payments field, it's not all that alien to you. You are integrated in China. You mentioned Alipay. Alipay is well, in many ways, could be considered mobile, and you know that's that's questionable. But things like WeChat or Paytm in India and Bcash in Bangladesh are these some of the payment systems that are on the horizon for you? Absolutely. So we we have, I mean, I should say, uh, mobile is a is a, a a substantial focus for us. I think what's interesting though about mobile payments is people often think of mobile payments as being this, you know, very separate. Um, constellation of whether payment methods or payment experiences that differs greatly from the traditional desktop payments experience. In reality, from a back-end perspective, there's often little to no difference. Um, so you take mobile payments, for instance, mobile card-based payments. From our perspective as a, as a provider in the back-end, they really don't look any different at all. Right? There's often a, a customer experience delta um, that the merchant is dealing with. So, you know, if you think uh, like an Uber payments experience is sort of quintessentially mobile, but uh, on the back end, it looks like any other e-commerce payment payment experience. Um, now, I think as you move into some markets where there are locally relevant payment methods um, that are either haven't made the transition to mobile or are just making it, that's where you do start to see some differences. So, for instance, if you take Ideal in the, in the Netherlands, it's it's the largest uh, online payment method in the Netherlands, and just now many of the Ideal banks are creating mobile friendly flows, whether through a mobile app or through a a, a mobile optimized page. Um, and so, so there are definitely some areas where mobile differentiates itself, but but by and large, mobile commerce doesn't really look that different from uh, traditional online commerce. Do, do countries matter? I mean, is can you cite an example of, you know, oh, such and such country was very difficult to work with? I won't put you on the spot by asking you what country, but do you, do you encounter something like that? Because I understand sometimes settlement, taking funds or settling funds in and out of a country can be extremely difficult. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, when I'm consulting with merchants, I will almost always recommend that the conversation be had on a market by market basis, because they, they often are tremendously different. I think Brazil is a very instructive example, where there are a whole host of 
idiosyncrasies that really only apply in Brazil. So you mentioned settlement, for instance. In Brazil, there's a, a default settlement delay of 30 days. Uh, wow. Yeah, which often you know creates real cash management and treasury implications for merchants that they need to think through ahead of market entry. Another you know interesting thing about Brazil is that uh, for card payments, there's a concept of installments and installments. Yeah, everything is twelve, twelve. Yeah, right. Same same thing in Turkey. I mean, you know, you look at a price of an Apple uh, MacBook Pro, and it's like one hundred and forty dollars, and you say, "Wow, why is it so cheap?" Right. And only then you realize right. it's, it's twelve payments of one hundred and forty bucks. Exactly, um, and that that seems an odd concept, I think, to many people in the U.S. Because we think, well, if you're using a credit card, you're you're already, you know, sort of. Uh, drawing out the spend over a period of time, potentially. Um, but it's a concept that's taken taken root in a number of markets, Mexico, Brazil, Turkey. Um, and it's one that if you don't understand, you're very unlikely to create a sustainable business, particularly retail business in that market. Um, mm. Likewise, in Brazil, there are a number of countries where it's fairly easy to do cross-border commerce, meaning to you know, if I'm leveraging, say, a U.S. entity and I could sell goods across the border into, say, Canada, um, I, can, I can present in Canadian dollar, but I can receive my settlement in U.S. dollar, and it all works pretty well. Uh, Brazil is one of those markets where, for various reasons, uh, largely because of the positions that the central bank and the tax authorities have taken, it's very difficult to have a real, healthy, cross-border Line of business. Yeah, it's more more or less asymmetrical uh, uh, transactions coming in, and if you want to expatriate your funds, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty difficult. Exactly, you pay very high taxes for any expatriation of funds. So, since you are standing on the peak and you are looking at mid market, would there be any chance of you just skipping the mid market and going directly to the low end market and going direct to the consumer? I won't discount the the possibility. Um, I think I think we are you know we're a very dynamic, fast moving company. We've got a very kind of Silicon Valley s culture in that respect. In that, if we see an opportunity, we'll we'll reach out and grab it. Um, but I think just based on our on our history, based on you know the the strengths that we have that really focus on that kind of white glove consultative approach to payments that that large enterprise merchants expect. It will probably be easier for us to approach the mid market from the top down, um, but you never know. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of rumors, a lot of talk about IPOs. Any plans about IPOing? Um, is that something you can talk about, or are you going to give me your vanilla reply? <laughs> I guess I'll have to give you the vanilla reply, but it but it has the. Uh, added benefit of being the true one, um, which is that at this at this time, we don't have any IPO plans, certainly not in the short term um, future. We, you know, we're really focused on growth at the moment. We think there's a lot of growth for us still to be had in the coming, you know, two, three years. And so at least you know, for that timeline, um, we, we're not looking to IPO. I mean, you're a 10 year old company and uh, you're still privately held your CEO inculcates a culture of frugal spending, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doesn't believe in high burn rates and so forth, which is a great thing. How much have you processed? Uh, could you give us a figure? Uh, we don't necessarily have to go into revenue figures, but how much has Adyen processed in, let's say, 2016? Sure. Um, so we just actually, a few weeks ago, announced our 2016 uh, figures. And in 2016, our, our volume grew by about 80%. Um, to about ninety billion dollars for fis for fiscal year twenty sixteen. Um, so that's almost coming into the close territory of, let's say, on a tangential scale or example of what Western Union business solutions would do. Yeah, that 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 sounds about right. How big is this market? Because it seems no one can ever give me an accurate figure. When I ask how much, how big is the B two B market for? Merchant processing or cross-border. Uh, I mean, the CEO of Earthport cited that cross-border payments for B two B, pure B two B, is estimated at between thirty and thirty-two trillion dollars, and that was back in twenty fifteen. So I don't know what the number is now. How big is your market? It, I mean, it's it's definitely 
it's it's pretty big. It's huge. I mean, you look at say a a, a Chase Payment Tech, um, you know, who's doing hundreds of billions of dollars um, annually in, in in volume. You know, possibly up, upwards of that. Um, and I think there are more and more players in the space um, who are achieving impressive numbers. At the end of the day, you know, the space is as big as commerce is, right? Uh, any any exchange of value from one place to another um, involves the payments industry. And I think there is a, definitely a, a key distinction to be drawn between consumer payments and B2B payments, as you were citing a moment ago, Um our focus is definitely on consumer payments and consumer payment methods. Um, but, you know, we have uh, a presence not just in e-commerce but also in physical point of sale. So really the opportunity is is, is the whole thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and do you plan to diversify outside the payment processing arena? Do you plan to do anything else in the payments? For example, do you want to go into uh, being a biller, uh, provide billing data, or be a settlement, you know, provider or for B two B transactions on the back end, or something like that? Or is it purely going to be processing of you know uh, on ground payment systems and merchants? You know, at, at this point, our focus is really on payments, and and our our laser focus is on on merchants, on serving merchants, uh, global merchants. I think that said, it's a it's a changing space, it's a dynamic space. I mean, you see things like PSD two coming down the pike that you know have the potential to really shape the 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 space and disrupt money more generally. Um, and so I, I don't want to discount anything there either. I think there will be a lot of ways to serve merchants kind of tangential to payments in the coming years. And um, I think, you know, we've got a lot of smart people with interesting ideas and uh, the sky's the limit. There is a bit, there's a huge drive that's happening worldwide now to uh, discount cash, to eliminate cash, to make people go from unbanked to bank, go from a cash economy to a digital economy. How well does that play into your ecosystem? How much potential does it provide for, to you as a market size or, a, you know, uh, what it, do you expect the business to increase? How do you look at that, this entire cashless drive that's happening? Yeah, it really aligns perfectly with our vision, uh, our vision for our business and just our vision for the market. We have... I mean, interestingly, we have never supported cash, ca true cash collection, or say check processing, um, things that we see as being really payment methods of the past. Uh, well, I mean, you know, in, in Dutch origins, you go, I mean, I went, I go to Amsterdam and there literally notices that, you know, cash is not accepted. Uh, but take a train ride after four hours, you're in Germany and cash is very happily accepted. There actually are signs that no cards are taken at this location, you know? No, indeed. Um, I mean, and, and, and look, it's a, it's a space that where the pace of change is very different across verticals, across markets. Uh, but uh, in the end, we're, we're placing a bet that over the long term, the digital economy or the, the piece of the economy that, that lives in the digital world uh, comes to really dominate, not just in, uh, in the Western markets where you would think, but you know there are a lot of developing markets that are leapfrogging whole, whole stages of um, – of that development process and kind of moving directly into say broad access to banking, um, like Brazil, for instance. So I think, um, our, our vision really focuses on that, uh, that digital piece of the market. And, and we're definitely excited to see the, the evolution away from cash. Um, of course, you have these kind of these, these interesting payment methods like Boleto that sit somewhere in between, Right, but they allow us to treat it more as a as a digital payment instrument, uh, but the consumer to treat it as cash. And I think it'll be interesting to see how how those payment methods evolve over the coming years. Two questions: Do you allow? And these are the last two questions: Do you allow startups to work with you? Are those kind of you know kind of the customers who can call you up and start working with you? Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, we 
we don't really turn people away. So it's, you know, when I say we're focused on large enterprises, um, that's, that's definitely where our, you know, sales target has been, if you will. Um, but we, we don't turn people away and we get, we get really excited, particularly on our San Francisco office about working with these high growth companies that, that are going to have interesting and complex uh, needs, particularly on an international scale within a relatively short period of time. You know, I mentioned that I came from Uber, um, where we expanded to, I think we were in four countries when I started. And by the time I left there, we were in 50 some odd uh, markets. And that kind of expansion, you know, we're, we're a bunch of payments geeks, international <laughs> global payments geeks. So we really get excited about that um, mm. and are happy to field those inquiries. Very good. And hiring, as you're expanding, are you hiring? And if so, how can people get in touch with you? And more importantly, what type of hiring are you looking uh, doing right now? Definitely always hiring. Um, I think we've, we've probably got at least a handful of open roles in, in almost all of our offices uh, at this point. Definitely a great deal of hiring in Amsterdam and in San Francisco. Um, I think uh, applicants can are, can best check out what we've got available at our website, adyen, that's A-D-Y-E-N dot com, uh, and there's a jobs page. Um, and I think in terms of the, the kind of roles we're hiring for, uh, technical roles are largely focused in Amsterdam, so if, if we have developers that are interested uh, and potentially interested in living in one of the best cities in Europe, we always have uh, opportunities for developers in Amsterdam. Um, we also have kind of technical support or implementation roles open in a lot of our offices. On the more commercial side of things, we've got sales, uh, business development opportunities, and account management opportunities in a lot of our offices as well. And for us, I think it's important to note that account management is less of a sales function and more of a management consulting and, and relationship management function. So I think it, it presents interesting opportunities and challenges that are a bit different than a lot of other providers, either in our space or any kind of enterprise service space. Which uh, is the Adyen differentiator, right? Right, right, indeed. And then, um, and then, of course, a lot of just interesting kind of back-end roles, whether those be finance roles, compliance, um, legal, we're really growing by leaps and bounds. So the, the opportunities are, are pretty substantial. Uh, before we end, I did want to ask you some of the names that you can share of who are your clients. Sure. Um, we've had, I mean, traditionally a lot of success, um, both. I mean, I, I, I get it. Uber is one of them, right? So <laughs> yeah, Uber is one of them. Um, but also a lot of other big tech names. Uh, I mean, Netflix, Spotify, Etsy, you know, and the list goes on and on in the in the tech side of the world. Uh, more recently, we've gotten a lot of traction with our omni-channel proposition, our in-store uh, proposition, with a lot of luxury retailers in particular. You can think mer merchants like Burberry, Tory Burch, uh, River Island, Mango, um, and and then in Europe, you know, we have a really broad selection of clientele. Uh, we have a very healthy airline practice with, I think, at this point, over 30 airlines uh, that we work with. So we're really kind of all over the map, um, but our but our big focus has been tech and, and luxury retail. And I think that's where we'll continue to see a lot of growth. Well, you know, it's always wonderful to hear about uh, Adyen because I, you know, I learned about you guys about, I think, six years ago. Not many people knew about them. Or about you then, but certainly are a large blip on the radar now. And I wish you all the success. Luke, it's been awesome having you here. Thank you very much. And any last parting words? You know, we're more than happy to share it. Uh, no, thank you, Faisal. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the show and um, look forward to some of the interesting topics I'm sure you guys will be tackling over the next uh, months and years. Good on you, sir. We'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.